thank you very much to our lightning talk speakers. Now, before we move into the closing keynote, I want to remark that inclusivity is a theme that you've seen running throughout the day. You've seen it talked about in the context of data, of technology, of governance. Furthermore, tomorrow is International Day of Persons with Disabilities, making this a fitting crossroads for us to have a conversation on inclusivity. So I invite you to take that home with you and come back tomorrow and build it into your conversations. It is now my honor to introduce our closing speaker for the day, Annette Dixon. Annette is the Vice President for Human Development at the World Bank, overseeing the education, health, nutrition, and population, gender, and social protection, and jobs global practices. She's a longtime advocate for young people as agents of change, and she was previously the World Bank's Vice President for the South Asia region. Let's welcome Annette to the stage. Good afternoon, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, Noriana uh, uh, omitted to say one thing. As I started my professional life as a youth activist, I was at one stage uh, a member of the National Youth Council of my country, and I trained initially as a youth development worker, and that was my pathway to eventually working in uh, development at the World Bank. So it's a real pleasure for me personally to be here with an audience of young activists. Um, and I know many of you have traveled a long way, so it's great that you've made it here. I think uh, this, this Youth Summit has become a really important event in the annual calendar of the World Bank, but I think at this time in the world, it's even more important. Um, I think there's a lot more uncertainty in the world. Um, and it's at these moments that young people want to find ways to have their voice heard and to be included and to be able to see pathways to the future. So one of the ways that the World Bank is trying to respond is to, to provide opportunities for us to hear from all of the stakeholders in the society, most importantly young voices, uh, but along with others like civil society, academia, uh, private sector, and of course governments. So this Youth Summit is, I think in many ways, it's, it's more than a forum, it's more than a conference. It's a, an important point in the dialogue that we have but we also hope that it will play a role in shaping your future as individuals and the way you see the world around you. Um, one of the things when you come to the World Bank, you hear lots of stories about solutions to some of the most critical development challenges that the world faces at the community level, at the province or state level, at the national and at, and at the international level. And I hope that when you when you talk to each other, you will learn from the rich experience that you all have of things that are working and things that are not working in the development of your own countries. Um, and I think some of the most imp important and powerful success stories that come from uh, these events are from those of you who are tackling some of the most difficult challenges head on. So what I wanted to do today is to talk about the World Bank and why we're investing particularly in young people and in what we call human capital, because we think this is one of the most important investments that countries can make at this time in the world. Now this is, this is because of, I think you all appreciate that one of the most important challenges that we see in the world are the millions of young people who are coming out of education systems, if they were lucky enough to get to an education system, and trying to find pathways to jobs, to livelihoods. Uh, and, and this is something that actually deeply worries not only individual young people who are themselves job seekers, but the policy makers in nearly all of the countries in the world. When we ask policy makers what are the things that keep them awake at night, it's often, will there be jobs for the young people in my country? Now we know that young people are almost three times as likely to be unemployed than adults are. Um, and that's true across developing and developed countries. Um, but over the next decade, we also know that there will be nearly 600 million people looking for jobs. So that's in 10 years, we have to find jobs for an additional 600 million young people. 
And most of these young people are, of course, living in the poorest countries, which have much younger uh, or la larger cohorts of young people in their population. So what is our advice to countries, and, and, and what is the starting point that uh, we, we suggest that countries take? Firstly, of course, it's an imperative for countries to invest in their children and young people. Your human capital, and what, what we mean by that is your ability to realize your full potential in terms of your health outcomes, your knowledge, your capabilities, your skills, and your resilience. These are the things that we accumulate through, through our lifetime, and these are what equips us to reach our full potential and to become productive members of our society. So human capital is critical for helping young people to build pathways to help them to find jobs. And as, as the world is evolving, human capital is even more important, and I'll tell you a bit more about why. Now, for the first time last year, we released an index that measures how much a country is actually investing and achieving the full potential of its young people. And what we did was we found those human development outcomes, those outcomes that, are cr that we know are critical for young people to have to achieve their full potential. And we measured those things that we know are directly related, related not just to how an, uh, uh, the full potential of an individual, but the potential of those individuals collectively to contribute to the productivity and growth of their country. So when you aggregate each individual's outcomes, what does it mean for a country? And, and we put together this human capital index. And so this index really shows us something very, very alarming. Nearly 60% of the children being born today will be as half as productive as they could have been if they had the full health and education that, that is possible. Now, we know that no country is achieving 100%, but the top countries are achieving about 88% of their full potential in terms of the human development outcomes. But that number, of course, varies enormously between the countries and the, uh, across the countries in the world. Now, for you, for you here today, this Human Capital Index is a really important tool for you to look at your country and, and as agents of change to look at how well your communities are doing on these outcomes that we know are important. So this index actually provides you with a transparent opportunity to actually assess how well your country is doing on these, on these outcomes. And it gives, we hope that this data will actually enable young people to hold their, their governments accountable for what, what a job that they're doing. Now, you can, you can find this index, you can find your country. Um, and, and we know it's, I think, I think we all know that this stuff is important, but the reason we've done it is because we want the investments that are taking place in the heads of children and young people like you to be counted as just as important as the investments in the energy sector or in the road sector or in the transport sector or, or, or wherever. Because the crisis that we have in the world is actually a crisis that's inside the heads of the children. The children, the half of the children in the developing world who cannot read by their 10th birthday. The half the children in uh, some countries in the world, half of the children, uh, the countries at the bottom of the index, half of the children are born uh, low, low height for age, and in their first couple of years, they don't achieve their full height for age, which we, means that they are stunted, and this affects their brain development. So their physical development is even impeded by um, uh, their poor outcomes. So we know that this crisis in human capital is not, it's not easy for policy makers to see it. And so we're using this index to try and make this more uh, apparent to, to policy makers. Now, I'm really lucky uh, personally to have grown up in New Zealand, 
um, uh, at a time when New Zealand made very, very important investments in the development of children. And it was a time when my country was relatively rich uh, and put a priority on uh, school, uh, getting all kids to school early, getting kids into early childhood development, making sure there was good nutrition, um, and, and really giving kids the best start in life. And in the space of one generation in my family, my parents grew up at a time during World War II where they didn't have any chance for a secondary school education. They both finished school at the age of 12. But in the space of one generation, the life chances of my parents' children were in, infinitely improved compared, compared to theirs. And I was, of course, able to not only benefit from a great preschool education, I always say I got my job at the World Bank because I had a great preschool education and I truly believe that's true because it really, it really did change the life chances uh, of my siblings and I. But my parents, their aspirations for their kids were bounded by their own life experience. So my parents thought it was enough to get their kids through high school. They, they thought that that would be a successful outcome for their kids. And little did they know that um, at least one of their kids, uh, I'm, one of, I'm one of four in my family, and two of us were able to go to university, and I've ended up working at the World Bank. So for me, it's actually a personal mission to make sure that girls around the world have the same life chances that I had, because I know how much it has uh, been of benefit, not just to me, but to our entire family. And so we actually say the most important opportunity that a country has to develop is to invest in the empowerment of its girls and boys um, and to ensure that uh, women's social and economic empowerment is at the center of a country's development strategy. Because we know that one of the best investments, the biggest return on investment that a government can make is educating girls. Because not only do those girls benefit, their children in turn are healthier and better educated. And so it's a multiplier. But at the same time, it's also important for countries to actually create opportunities for women to participa participate in the economic life of the society. And we find in too many countries, women, are, even when they are getting educated, are not finding a pathway into the labor market and are not able to um, participate uh, in the same way as men. And we see that um, there are still a huge gap between the numbers of uh, women and men participating uh, in the labor market, and the earnings gap is also still significant. So we think that it's really important that there, that there is a sense that, that no country in the world can reach its full potential unless it gives the same opportunities to boys and to girls, uh, to men and to women. The developing world, as I said earlier, is, is home to the largest numbers of young people. And so this is a critical development challenge for these countries. So I think that one of the things that we know, unless kids are, are able to develop to their full potential, they won't have voice and agency at the levels that they need to, to be able to speak up, to actually have an impact on policies and the way they're shaped. Um, and so I think that uh, we, we really want to, to see human capital as actually not only important for the productive life of the society, but also important for the social and civic society. Children who can't read not only face huge impediments to finding pathways to jobs, but they also have a much greater challenge in terms of participating fully in the life of their community and their society. So we really want young people to develop to their full potential to have opportunities for social mobility uh, and for participation in the full aspects of the economic, social and civic uh, aspects of the society. Now, I hope I haven't been too boring for you. In New Zealand, we talk about stale, pale males. 
and I'm your uh, closing speaker as the stale, pale female. Um, but I really want to say again how great it is you're all here. I know you worked hard to get here, and we expect heaps of you when you go back to your own countries uh, and to carry on your life of youth activism there. So thank you very much. I said I would take some questions, but I probably killed you with boredom. <laughs> no, somebody's coming up to the microphone. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful presentation. This is Riyadh. I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, what I basically do, I'm the co-founder of World Happiness and Peace Foundation. Uh, in my country, we educate students on developing compassion, empathy, gratitude, tolerance, humility, because these are the things we believe that that can really change the world. And for making a smarter city and human capital, these are very important. So my question too is that, what, uh, what are the steps World Bank is planning to do to support this kind of initiative we are, we are doing in the, uh, I mean, South Asia and some part of these countries? And also, what's your plan? Because beside education, I believe these are the skills, these are the human behavior are very important to change our communities. So thank you so much. Thank you. we we'll take a couple more. Sure. Um, hello, my name is Pankti. I'm from India. Uh, I think uh, besides the unemployment issue that my country is facing, the also is the problem of job insecurity that is growing. Uh, the need to t uh, turn to more contractual jobs has led to a lot of like uh, insecurity issues in the youth as to how they're going to sustain their finances in the long term. So what is like the World Bank's view on more contractual jobs being floated in the market? Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Mitali, also from India. Uh, in my work with the Asian Development Bank, what we've encountered is that it becomes very difficult to convince our clients, whether it's state governments or uh, municipal governments, of the value of investing in human capital especially when their own educational attainment is low. So how would you advise uh, young, you know, sort of change makers like myself when we are in the field and dealing with our, you know, clients, how do we convince them of the value of investing in educational programs? Hello, thank you so much. Um, I'm Rissan Barrett from Belgium. Um, so my question, um, so you mentioned you have that human development uh, index, you have a few other um, projects ongoing, uh, more particularly on youth unemployment. So OCD um, says it's about 11.17% youth employment rate. Um, how do you push governments and how do you collaborate or build partnerships with organizations like OCD or the UN uh, or local cities to actually make sure that we are ready for that um, uh, flow of uh, people into the job markets by developing those skills. Hello, my name is Nino, and the, my question is how do you think we can tackle gender inequality in smart cities, and um, how World Bank also can help with that? Hi, my name is Jessica George uh, from Mozambique, and my question is, given uh, that a country like Mozambique has so many issues um, in terms of social economic issues, when it comes to education and health, specific, specifically of young women, it's left to the, black, the back burner. So how can we as youth, um, which also don't have a lot of opportunities to be here in this space, collaborate with the World Bank to push for um, these ideas to be on priority? Hi, Caroline, originally from Poland, now from New York. Um, one of the greater problems that New York suffers with is homelessness, and then that leads to overcrowding in shelters. How can we help this overcrowding um, and homelessness issue in New York City um, by creating and investing in human capital? What can organizations do? What can the youth do to help better this in the future? 
Um, hi, I'm Rafael from Brazil, and um, I, I'm never going to answer all these questions, but oh, yeah. keep them coming. Um, <laughs> Noriana is standing you, at the you back. You mentioned about human capital <laughs> being important to contribute for the growth and uh, productivity productivity of a country. I just wanted to know uh, what the World Bank what World Bank is doing f um, for climate change uh, and how that um, uh, aligns with uh, growth and uh, economic growth. Hi, I'm Sasha, I'm from Virginia. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the role of mental health in terms of building up human capital. Okay, um, right, I'll take a stab at uh, some of these. So it's gonna be lightning answers, okay? So on building happiness and social trust, um, uh, I've been really convinced by the work on social cohesion and social capital that complements what I talked about on human capital, which is you get social trust uh, uh, building when you have dialogue across social groups. I'm, I'm, I think that uh, societies that find ways to mix people up so you meet and talk to people who are different from you in a different social class, in a different ethnic group, of a different religion, it builds human connection. So as much as possible, public policy needs to try and actually foster this environment. And I know that you're talking about resilient cities. I think resilient cities and cities that are designed well can actually help to facilitate social cohesion and social trust. But the other th part of the answer is that countries that grow uh, in their development, uh, people get happier. People, uh, and, and it, it, so uh, development helps to build happiness and, and social cohesion as well. Although it's not obviously also, it's not universally true and inequality can undermine that uh, to a large extent. Now a question on job, se job security in the gig economy is a, big, is a big issue. Now in the developing world, most jobs are in the informal economy, so people don't have job security in much of the, of, of the world. But what we think is really important for everybody is that they can access social benefits regardless as whether their job is informal, formal, or, or what else, that policies, <coughs> Policies that are based on a certain sort of uh, preconception of what a job is will, will miss out a lot of people. So it's really important that people have access to safety nets and access to social benefits like health and old age pensions and so on, regardless of what the nature of their employment was. Because increasingly, people in the world are working as you said, in, in the gig economy and the nature of jobs is changing. And those jobs are growing much faster than traditional jobs, by the way. Um, <clears throat> how to persuade policymakers to invest in human capital? That's what I get paid my big bucks to do. And this index is actually a way of trying to do that. Um, and what we've actually tried to do, and people, people will say that, you know, human capital is really important in its own right. It's really you know, it's intrinsically important that all kids survive to their, past their fifth birthday, that women don't die in childbirth any longer. These are things that are intrinsically important. But it's also really important for the economic growth of a country. So I can now tell a policymaker that they are losing by being only at 0.5 on the index to 100 they are losing about 1.2% of economic growth per year. So it's actually, a, it's contributing to the low performance of the country. Now that's, it's not the only part of the message, but for some policymakers, that's the best way to actually convey the message. Um, and so that's what, we, that's what we try to do at the World Bank, is to actually encourage policymakers not only to invest more, but to invest more wisely in things that will get good outcomes. Because there's a lot of stuff that's not working in the world and we need to actually help policymakers under, understand the difference. 
Now, in the index, uh, we, we are constrained by the things that we have data to measure across a large number of countries. We would like to add more things into the index. We know that learning doesn't stop when you leave school. People learn on the job, and some of the most important learning that takes place, takes place after the end of formal education. So we want to evolve this index, but what we have in the index today is what we have data for, and we will continue to push to develop it. Um, so I, I hope that in time we will be able to rate countries on the way in which, the pathway in which, or the rate at which kids are able to access job markets. Um, how to actually build gender, how to tackle gender inequality in cities. To me, this is, uh, you know, f I, I think cities are where young people gravitate to. So this is probably one of, for the Youth Summit, this is a, a, is a defining issue in, in most countries. Most countries, young people, unless they have very strong attachments to a livelihood opportunity and to family, they will gravitate to, to cities to try and find jobs. Now for women, the way in which cities are designed is really important for gender equality because a lot of women cannot travel safely uh, in their countries to jobs. So for me, the, one of the most important things for promoting gender equality in city design is to make cities safer for women. And that means things like, very practical things like street lighting. It means, uh, you know, safe, safe places at bus stops or train stations for women to wait. Sometimes it means uh, separate seating on the trains for women. Sometimes it's about having, uh, a lot of times, and we know this from schools, it's about having clean working toilets for women to be able to access education and jobs. You know, girls who are menstruating are not going to go to school if there's not clean uh, working toilets. It's just, uh, it's well known. And so the uh, same thing applies in the design of cities. And actually, it's not just young people that cities need to be thinking about. In many countries, cities now need to be thinking about how to enable uh, people to age in place and remain at home and supported in, in cities as well. So actually, the way in which cities are designed for people actually th needs to think across the whole life cycle spectrum to make cities more people friendly and more livable and more productive uh, for people who uh, come to cities. Um, I, uh, On New York and homelessness, I, I uh, have very little uh, experience in working on, on this issue. I mean, it strikes me that uh, the, the key issue is uh, about affordable housing for people who really uh, shut out of housing opportunities. Now, a lot of it is to do with safety nets and how well safety nets work. And if, I don't know if many of you noticed, but today we had uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo here at the World Bank, uh, who they just won the Nobel Prize for Economics, and they have devoted their professional lives to evaluating development interventions. And a lot of the work that they have done on social protection and social safety net systems is probably relevant to how you tackle your housing crisis, because in my mind, it's mostly an affordability challenge. It's also about how uh, people are supported who have special needs, who have mental illness or disabilities and so on. Um, these are the people who often get uh, most excluded. And on climate change, uh, I think we have, uh, here at the World Bank, the World Bank is incredibly committed to everything we do trying to actually mitigate uh, the impact of climate change and to help, uh, to help communities adapt to the reality of climate change. And we've committed ourselves to ensuring that everything we do, we achieve at least 30% of our financing results in climate co-benefits. So that, that applies to it, all the sectors that we finance in. So it's not just um, uh, clean energy, for example. It's also ensuring that school systems 
are developed in a way which actually helps to promote um, or reduce the impact of climate change, prevent and uh, help communities to adapt. And then lastly, on mental health, I really worry that mental health is probably one of the most neglected health issues in developing countries. Uh, depression is under-recognised. There are barely any medical uh, mental health services in many of the countries that, that, that we finance in, and we are committed to trying to strengthen primary health care systems to enable uh, mental illness to be diagnosed and treated even in very poor, low capacity settings. It's a, it's a huge issue and under-recognised globally. So I hope that I manage on how to collaborate with the World Bank. Uh, <laughs> um, I think obviously you've, you need to make contact with the World Bank office in your country. In some countries, they do have youth engagement uh, advisory groups. I was in um, um, Lebanon a few months back, and the World Bank office in Beirut has a youth advisory group and, and actually had an ongoing platform for dialogue. So some offices have that. Some have more one-off events. Pakistan, there's a, a youth uh, te and technology event every year. So there's different events in different countries. So contact the um, external communications and relationships team in your World Bank office is a great place to start to make contacts and to find out what the World Bank's doing in your country. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Annette, and my gosh, thank you guys. So much curiosity and questions. Save something for tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> so now before we move into the reception, a quick announcement. You may have noticed we had two contests running through the day, the social media contest and the innovation marketplace passport. Now when you move into the reception, we're going to draw the raffle and you're going to hear the winners of the social media contest. So make sure you're there. Thank you all so much for your energy. And we're now going to move into the reception in the MC atrium for a dialogue with senior World Bank management. And thanks to those who joined us online. And we look forward to seeing you and hearing from you again tomorrow.